In the last couple of videos, we discussed functions and graphing techniques for functions in detail. In the next few videos, we're going to talk about specific categories of functions and some of the key characteristics of these types of functions. So the first function we're going to look at is the polynomial function or the category of polynomial functions. So you've seen polynomials a lot, whether you actually called them polynomials or not. So what is a polynomial? This is going to be the general form for a polynomial function. So notice we've got our function notation f of x. Remember, f is the label for a function. So it could be f, it could be g, it could be h, it could be anything we want. And then x, whatever's in parentheses, represents the input for the function. So if we're just talking about the function in general, typically we're going to use x as our input. If we were to replace this x with a number, then that means we're treating that specific value as our input. We're plugging it into the function and we're matching an output to that specific input. Now to the right of the equal sign, we have the expression representing the actual function, the rule that tells you how you take an input and get an output from it. This is the general form for a polynomial. And I know it looks complicated, but I promise it's not going to be complicated or it's not going to be as complicated when we put real numbers in the problem. So as of right now, it looks almost completely variable. You're going to find that when we, um, when we write things in general in algebra, things tend to look complicated. But when we put it in the context of a real problem, most of the things that are variable here are actually going to be replaced by fixed numbers and it'll look a lot more simple. So I want you to notice all of the x's. We have our input x. What's happening is we have individual terms, in other words, clusters of things being added or subtracted, that involve this variable x. Each of the x's has an exponent. So we have the exponent n, the exponent n minus 1, dot, 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 just means continuing in the same fashion. Now this particular x doesn't have a written exponent, which means it's an implied exponent of 1. And then notice this last term, it doesn't have an x or an exponent at all. If we were to put an x in here, we could put an exponent of 0. Anything to the 0 power is 1. But this last term in general does not have an x. It's what we call a constant term. It doesn't have a variable attached to it. Now n, n is going to be an actual number, just like n minus 1 will be an actual number. It has specific requirements, so n is going to have to be a whole number, it's going to have to be a positive number. All of the exponents are going to have to be whole positive numbers. So anything where we have an x and maybe it has an exponent that's fractional or it has an exponent that's negative, that means we're no longer looking at what we're calling something polynomial. That means we have a different type of function, not a polynomial function. So all of these exponents are going to be positive numbers, they're going to be whole numbers. Now the highest exponent, we're going to think of n as the highest exponent, and then we can step down one at a time um, in terms of the remaining exponents. We call this highest exponent the degree of the polynomial. So say the highest exponent is 2, well that would be called a second degree polynomial. We also call that a quadratic polynomial. If the highest exponent is 3, we have a third degree polynomial, which we also call a cubic polynomial, and then so on and so forth. So this degree, this highest exponent, is going to give us a lot of information about the function, specifically the kinds of things we can expect from its graph. Okay, so x is our input, the x's can have exponents, they're going to be whole numbers, they're going to be positive numbers. Now the a's, notice we have a bunch of a's and they each have a subscript. These a's will not be variable when you're looking at an actual polynomial function. Those a's represent constant coefficients. So if we were to take each of our x terms and multiply it by a number out front, that number is then taking the place of the a. The a represents whatever number we might have multiplied by our x with its exponent. Well, what if we don't see a number in front of the x? That doesn't mean it doesn't have a coefficient. What it means is that the coefficient is just understood to be 1. So say we just had an x right here and we didn't see anything in front of it. Well, that just means that a sub 1 would be the value 1. We would just have a coefficient of 1 for that particular term. Now these subscripts, all the subscripts mean is a sub n just means we're going to match this coefficient 
with the same exponent on that particular x. So a sub n is just the coefficient that's going to go with x to the n. a sub n minus one is the coefficient that goes with x to the n minus one. a sub one is the coefficient that goes with x to the first power. So it's just a reference system to tell us this coefficient goes here, it goes with this part of the polynomial. But again, when you have an actual polynomial, you're not gonna see a, you're not gonna see subscript, you're just going to see the constant coefficient for that particular x with its particular exponent. Now the a sub n, that's gonna be the most important coefficient we see here in the entire polynomial. It's the one that's attached to the term with degree. So remember the degree is the highest exponent. The coefficient that goes with that term is what we call the leading coefficient. So we call it the leading coefficient because typically we're going to list things with exponents from the highest exponent down to the lowest exponent in order. So if we have our terms in that order, this is going to be the coefficient that leads. It's gonna be the one at the front of the polynomial. So knowing what the leading coefficient and the degree are, that's gonna give us a lot of information about our polynomial function and what we can expect for its graph. Now it's worth talking about just a little bit, domain and range for any function we talk about, any category of function. Domain, remember that means all the numbers that we could plug into the function. In other words, all the different inputs that our function could have. Every function that falls under this category of being polynomial has a domain of all real numbers. So what that means is that this variable x, our input variable, it can take on any value we want. We can plug that number into the function and we can get an output out, no issues involved whatsoever. Now what that means for the purposes of graphing is that our graph is going to continue all the way from the left-hand side of the coordinate plane to the right-hand side. If our domain is all real numbers, and we think of that as representing x, then negative infinity to positive infinity along x just means the graph goes all the way from the left side to the right side of the coordinate plane. The term we use for this is continuous. The graph is going to be continuous. There's no holes. If the domain were not all real numbers, so that would mean there are some specific x values that we can't plug into our function, that would lead us to having some holes or some gaps in our graph. That would mean that we stop somewhere in the middle of the coordinate plane, and then maybe we pick back up and carry over from there. Um, for instance, the square root function that we looked at in the last section, that particular function does not have a domain of all real numbers. So if you'll remember, it didn't continue all the way from left to right. It started at the origin, and then it just continued to the right-hand side of the coordinate plane. Polynomial functions are going to start all the way on the left, continue all the way to the right, no holes, no breaks. And again, the word we use for this is the graph is continuous. Polynomial graphs are also going to be smooth, which just means there's no corners. We're not gonna have any jagged spots or spots where we'd suddenly have to stop drawing and then change directions. The curves are gonna be nice and smooth and fluid. You could draw them all the way from left to right without lifting your pencil. So what that means is that, for instance, the absolute value function, that is not going to be a polynomial function. If you picture the absolute value graph, remember it's a V-shaped graph. Right there in the center at the origin, we have what we can think of as a corner. We have a graph that's not smooth because we have that corner. So something involving absolute value would not fall under this category of being polynomial. We can't, although it is continuous, we can't draw it without making a corner. So we've actually looked at three functions so far that would fall under this category of being polynomial. So the identity function, which is f of x is equal to x, that would be considered polynomial. The, the um, squaring function, also called the quadratic function, the squaring function would be considered polynomial. And then the cubing function would also be considered polynomial, just based on the structure of our function. And if you picture what those graphs look like, remember they start all the way on the left-hand side of the coordinate plane, and the tail tells us that we go all the way to the right-hand side of the coordinate plane. So those graphs have a domain of all real numbers.
So these are some examples of what polynomial graphs might look like. There are certain things they have in common. There are certain things that are different from graph to graph. So what I do want you to notice is each of these graphs has a pair of tails and the tails continue all the way from the left hand side to the right hand side of the graph. Again, the term for that that we use is continuous. Also, even these graphs where things kind of change directions, we have these little curves where suddenly something is increasing and then decreasing again, something like that. Notice there's still no corners. If we were to zoom in on each of those spots on the graph, there will not be any sharp edges or any corners. It's going to be a nice smooth fluid curve as we continue from left to right. Now, why do some of the tails point in opposite directions? and why do some of them point in the same direction? So you'll notice for the top three graphs, each of those pairs of tails points in opposite directions, whereas the bottom graphs, the tails all point in the same direction. That actually has to do with the degree of the polynomial. So the actual polynomial functions have been listed below the graphs for you. We can determine what the tails on the graphs are going to do based on what we see from the polynomial function. What we're specifically looking for is the degree. We're looking at the terms involving x, and we want to identify the highest exponent in our polynomial. So for this first polynomial, it's f of x is equal to x minus two, okay? The only term we have with an x is gonna be the first term. We don't see an exponent, so the understood exponent is one, okay? The next one, the highest exponent is going to be three. And then the last one, the highest exponent is going to be five. So what these three functions have in common is the fact that the highest exponent is an odd number. When the highest exponent is an odd number, that tells us that the tails are going to point in opposite directions. So one's gonna be pointing upward towards positive infinity. One's gonna be pointing downward towards negative infinity. Now that's not the case for the bottom three graphs. If you look at their degrees, this first one has a highest exponent of two, the second one has a highest exponent of four, and then the last one has a highest exponent of six. All of these degrees are even numbers. So whenever the degree of our polynomial function is an even number, that tells us that the tails are gonna be pointing in the same direction. Either both are gonna be up or both are gonna be down. Now, all six of these functions so that show the same kind of behavior in terms of what their tails are doing per category for all the odd functions, all the even functions, or all the odd and even degrees, let's say that. So notice for these three functions, we're pointing down to the left and then we're pointing up to the right, and that's the same for all three. If we were to take that term where we identify the degree, the term that has the highest exponent, Notice all of those terms are positive terms. So we would say that the leading coefficient is a positive number. The coefficient on each of those terms is a one. If we were to take each of those coefficients and then make it a negative number, having that negative out front would actually reflect the graph vertically. It would take each of these graphs, it would reflect it vertically. So if you think back when we looked at those elementary functions, looked at all the transformations, when we put a negative out front of our function, multiplied by a negative, that gave our graph a vertical reflection. So we took the starting graph and we reflected it vertically across the x-axis. The same thing would apply here. So if we were to look at all of those terms, those leading terms that have our degree exponent attached to them, if we were to put a negative in front of each of those terms, that would reflect our graph. So suppose we put a negative in front of this particular term, in front of our x. That would take this graph and it would flip it. So the tail on the right would no longer be pointing upward, it would be pointing downward. It would reflect over the x-axis. The tail on the left would no longer be pointing downward, it would flip and point upward. So rather than falling on the left and rising on the right, we would be rising on the left and falling on the right. 
So the degree didn't change. The degree just tells us we'd be pointing in opposite directions, but having a negative out front instead of having a positive number out front would just flip the actual two directions that we're pointing in. Same kind of thing with these three graphs and these three functions. If we were to take those leading terms, the term that has the degree exponent, and instead of them being positive, make the coefficient on each of those negative, that would then reflect that graph and its tails. So this particular graph has tails that are both pointing upward. If we were to put a negative in front of our leading term, that would reflect the graph and both of the tails would be pointing downward. So putting the degree and the leading coefficient together is going to give us this information we need to know about where the tails are going to be pointing. So what's happening essentially as we fall off of the coordinate plane. We continue out to positive infinity or we continue out to negative infinity and there's four different combinations for what that can look like. So we can be pointing in opposite directions in either way or we can be pointing in the same direction either way. Now what that doesn't tell us is what happens in the middle. So knowing the degree, knowing the leading coefficient, all that's going to tell us is what the tails of the graph look like, which directions are the tails pointing in. In order to determine what happens in the middle, specifically with respect to the axes, where do we cross the axes? We think of those as key points. We need a little bit more information. So putting the tails, putting that extra information together typically gives us a pretty good picture of what our polynomial graph is going to look like. So we focus on intercepts. We've talked a little bit about how we'd find intercepts. Remember, intercepts are the locations where we would cross an axis. Intercepts occur where one of the coordinates, one of the variable values is going to be zero. Not only are these valuable for the sake of graphing, but when we put these functions into a real world context and we're using a function to model something, intercepts often have a specific meaning in applied situations. So finding the intercepts is beneficial for graphing, but it's also going to be beneficial when we start looking at functions in an applied context. So finding the x-intercepts, finding the y-intercept, if we have any of them, that's going to be something important we have to do in order to get a good graph and in order to understand the function we're looking at. So x-intercepts, where we cross the x-axis, that's going to occur when y is 0. So if we were to take our function and let y be 0, now what about, where's the y? Let's look back at this general polynomial function. Here's our general, po general polynomial function. I don't see a y here. Remember, f of x, our function notation, that replaced the y. So y and f of x mean the same thing. They mean the function output. So when we're talking about letting y be zero and you don't see a y, remember the f of x that we see, that replaced the y. So if we're letting y be zero, we're replacing this with zero, which essentially means just take the whole polynomial function or whatever function you're looking at and just set it equal to zero. If you're solving for x-intercepts, that's essentially what you're doing. You're setting your function equal to zero. You're replacing your f of x with zero. Okay, so we let y be zero. We replace f of x with zero. We also call x-intercepts zeros. It's not surprisingly because we are setting something to zero. We're setting the function to zero. They're also called roots. So x-intercepts, zeros, roots, ultimately they all mean essentially the same thing. Now x-intercepts are a lot more specific than these terms zeros and roots. So if you were to, for instance, take college algebra, you talk a little bit more about zeros and roots in sort of a broader context other than just for purposes of graphing. But finding those, all these different terms, they all mean the same thing. We find an x-intercept by letting y be zero and then solving for x. Now, how do you know how many x-intercepts you're going to have? You can only have one y-intercept, but you can have multiple x-intercepts. How do you know how many you're going to have? How do you know if you found all of them? The degree of your polynomial is going to give you the maximum number of x-intercepts that you can expect to find. Now it doesn't officially say this is how many you're going to find. What it means though is once you find that many, you're not going to find any more. So suppose the highest exponent in your polynomial is three. Well, that means the maximum number of x-intercepts you're ever going to find are going to be three. 
It's not a guarantee that you're going to find three X intercepts, but if you were to find three, you know you're done. You know you found all of them. So that's gonna cap the number of X intercepts you're going to find. If the highest exponent is two, you'll have a maximum of two. If the highest exponent is one, that means you have a linear function. A linear function and its graph, that can only cross the x-axis one time, so you'll have a maximum of one x-intercept. Now your y-intercept, typically x-intercepts are slightly more complicated to find. The y-intercept, if you have one, is typically gonna be the easier one to find. So you're going to find your y-intercept by letting x be zero. So when we're talking about function notation, Letting x be zero means we're plugging in zero to our function. We're replacing our generic input, what we call x, with zero, which tells us substitute a zero in place of every x you see in your function. So essentially what's gonna happen is the right-hand side of your function where you see the actual expression, the actual rule for the function, all of those variables are gonna go away and it's just going to be a zero. We're subbing in a zero, and then the goal is just to simplify what we have down to a single number, and that single number is going to represent our y-intercept. And again, you can only have one y-intercept. That's not only for polynomial functions, that's for any function. The reason you can only have one y-intercept is because if you have more than one, your graph fails the vertical line test. So remember, the vertical line test is what we use to determine if we're looking at a function when we have a graph. The vertical line test says your graph can be crossed by a vertical line at most one time in order for it to be a function. Well, if you picture the y-axis and your graph crossing it twice, that means you now have a vertical line that would cross more than one time. It means you now have a graph that doesn't represent a function. So anytime we have a function, maximum we're gonna find one y-intercept. Now some functions will not have a y-intercept, but because a polynomial function is continuous, it starts on the left-hand side of the coordinate plane and goes all the way across to the right, we know that it has to cross the y-axis somewhere. So every polynomial function will have exactly one y-intercept, and we find it algebraically, again, by letting x be zero. So let's look at a couple of polynomial functions. We want to do three things. So first thing we want to do, we want to identify the degree. The degree tells us a little bit about the graph, and it also tells us how many x-intercepts we should expect to find. We want to find all of those x-intercepts, and then we also want to find the y-intercept. And then we're gonna draw the graph on the graphing calculator, just get a sense of what we're looking at. I'm also gonna show you how to use the graphing calculator to help with finding the intercepts. Because particularly when your function gets a little bit more complicated, finding the x-intercept specifically can also get a little bit more complicated. So here's our first function, f of x is equal to seven x plus 21. So this is linear but linear is a specific category of polynomial functions. So we know this is polynomial because we have our x. It just has an exponent of one, so it's a whole number positive exponent. It has a coefficient. We have a term that doesn't have an x, but it doesn't violate any of the rules um, that we require for something to be polynomial. Now the degree of our function is always going to be the highest exponent attached to our input variable x. In this case, we only have one term that actually has an x, and this particular x doesn't have a written exponent. So we know when we don't see a written exponent, the understood exponent is going to be one. So that means this is a degree one polynomial. The degree of this polynomial is one. Now that tells us a couple of different things. Because it's an odd degree, that means we're going to have a graph that looks something like this, at least in terms of the tails. The tails are going to be pointing in opposite directions. So one will be pointing upwards towards positive infinity, one will be pointing downwards towards negative infinity. So that's one thing the degree tells us. The degree also tells us that maximum, this will be the number of x-intercepts we'll find um, that can then be graphed for this particular function. So in this case, we'll either have no x-intercepts at all, or we'll have one, but one is gonna be the maximum number of x-intercepts we're gonna find. So let's see if we can find an x-intercept for our function. 
So X intercepts mean we're solving for X and we're substituting zero for the other variable. The other variable in this case is Y. And remember, we don't really see a Y here. Where's the Y? The Y is the F of X that represents Y. So to find our X intercepts, we're going to take this particular expression, this particular thing representing Y, and we're going to replace it with zero. And so what that's going to look like is it's gonna look like taking our function, which is seven X plus 21, and setting it equal to zero. We're thinking of zero as our output. So the question we're asking now is, what would X have to be in order to get an output of zero? So what we're doing at this moment now is we're taking this equation where we substituted a zero in place of Y and we're solving for X, we're isolating the X. So in this case, this is a linear equation. We wanna isolate X in this linear equation. We have something multiplied and we also have something added. We're always gonna start by moving the addition first. So we have an added 21. We want to move it over to the other side of the equation because the goal is to isolate X. So because the 21 is added, we're gonna to have to subtract it to move it over. So I'm gonna subtract 21 from both sides, which then gives us 7X is equal to negative 21. Now the seven is multiplied by X, and so in order to get rid of that multiplication, we have to divide. So we're gonna divide both sides by seven, and negative 21 divided by seven is gonna give us negative three. Now, if you do this in the calculator, that's fine. If you don't, just make sure you remember the rules for signs, whenever the signs are opposite. So something like a negative divided by a positive, that's always gonna result in a negative output. So when signs are opposite and we're multiplying or dividing, the output's gonna be negative. When signs are the same, so positive and positive or negative and negative, the output's gonna be a positive number. So in this case, the output is negative and we've isolated our X. So X is going to be negative three. So because the degree tells us we have a maximum of one X intercept, we know this is gonna be the only X intercept we'll expect to find. So what this now means is that if and when we graph this particular function, this will be the location where we cross the x-axis. We'll cross the x-axis at negative three. Okay, now we want to find our y-intercept. We know there's gonna be exactly one for any polynomial function. So we wanna solve for y and substitute a zero in place of x. How do you remember what to do for each of your intercepts? Well, if it's an x-intercept, you're solving for x and substituting for y. If it's a y-intercept, you're solving for y and substituting for x. So that's the general rule with intercepts. So we're taking our function, we're replacing x with zero in order to find the location where we cross the y-axis. What that means is then plugging zero into our function. So f of zero, letting x be zero, tells us, take the rule for our function, seven x plus 21, and replace x with our input of zero. So our intercept is going to be seven times zero, we sub in the zero, plus 21, whatever that comes out to. Well, seven times zero, notice that term's gonna go away. Anything times zero is just zero. So that means the final value we get is 21. So our y-intercept in this case is going to be 21. Okay, so let's look at this graph in the graphing calculator. Let's get a picture for this. And that's gonna help us also verify our algebra here. So we're saying the x-intercept is negative three. We're saying the y-intercept is 21. We can verify that not only from the graph, but also from the table for the function that we get in our graphing calculator. So make sure you have your graphing calculator, make sure it's on. We wanna graph it. So again, we're gonna use our graphing utility, all of those buttons up at the top, hit Y equals, and then we wanna type in our function. So remember F of X, that's our Y. The Y part is already typed for us. All we have to type is the rule involving X. So our rule for X is going to be seven X plus 21 and then let's hit graph and let's see what that looks like. There we go, okay. Now remember yours may look slightly different. If it looks slightly different, it's probably a zoom setting. You may be in zoom standard, whereas I'm in zoom square. You can change your zoom settings using the zoom button. 
And then if you're in Zoom Standard, that's option six. If you're in Zoom Square, that's gonna be option five. It doesn't really matter which one of the two you're in. Just be aware if you're in Zoom Standard, the scale on the Y axis is smaller than the scale on the X axis. So you'll have the same graph, but it might look, look a little bit more slanted, something like that. It probably would look more slanted in terms of that direction. It would look like it's stretched a little bit that way. But this is our graph. This is what we expect to see. Now let's verify our intercepts from our graph. So first thing we wanna verify is our x-intercept. Where do we cross the x-axis? Well, let's zoom in and let's see if we can find where we cross the x-axis. So I went to zoom, I did zoom in. I want to zoom in closer to that location where we look like we crossed the x-axis. So zoom in gives me a cursor. I'm gonna take my cursor and I'm gonna move over and then I want to zoom in on this function. Having that cursor there tells me now when I hit enter in order to zoom, this will be the new point where I'm centered. So I'm gonna hit enter and it's gonna zoom in centered at that new location. Okay, so it looks like we're at x equals negative three. How can we guarantee that that's exactly where it is? It could be slightly lower, it could be slightly higher than x equals negative three. How can we verify that it truly is negative three? Well, one thing we can do is we can hit the trace button, which is then going to lock the cursor onto the graph. In theory, we should be able to trace directly onto our intercept. So once you hit trace, you're locked onto your graph and you can use the arrows to move around, but you'll stay on your graph. So it looks like it's not gonna quite hit at our intercept if we move around, but we know that when we're right above it, we're right around negative 2.9, and when we go below it, we're right at negative 3.04 or something like that. So we're close, okay? So more than likely it's negative three. How do we again completely verify that? How do we know it's not slightly higher, it's not slightly lower? This is where the table is going to be useful. So remember, you can get the table right above graph in blue. So second and graph is gonna take you into your table. What we're looking for is where on the table we have y is equal to zero. So remember to find an x-intercept, we let y be zero, and then we were solved for the associated value of x. If we can find x equals negative three, which is gonna be right there for me. Scroll around if you need to find it. You're finding x equals negative three. In order to verify that negative three is our x-intercept, negative three should match up with a y value of zero. In order to say that this value is an x-intercept, it has to correspond to a y value of zero. Well, sure enough, on our table, there at negative three, if you look at the associated y value, the associated y value is going to be zero. So negative three is going to be our x-intercept. Now, if you have more than one x-intercept, you may have more than one x-value that corresponds to a y-value of zero. You're gonna look for all of those different zeros. So all of those different zeros in y are then gonna to correspond to x-values that represent x-intercepts. Now, what about our y-intercept? It would be nice to check that. So we can see it from the graph if we want, or we can find it on the table. So remember to find our y-intercept, we let x be zero instead. So if I scroll to where x is zero, I'm looking for the y that goes with that. Well, when x is zero, the corresponding y value is gonna be 21. So that means 21 is going to be our y-intercept. If x is zero, this is the corresponding y value. So that's gonna be the y-intercept on our graph. So this table is going to be very, very valuable for handling these issues with intercepts, particularly as you encounter graphs that are more and more complicated. Use this table, not as a crutch, but use it to verify that your algebra actually makes sense. If for some reason what your algebra told you is the intercept doesn't match up with what the table says, a couple of different things could have happened. It's always important to verify that you did in fact type in what you intended. There are certain issues with typing in a function that may become problematic. You may type something and your calculator interp interprets it slightly differently than you really intended. So that's one possible issue. Another possible issue is maybe you made an algebraic mistake. So maybe for instance, 
difference. When you were supposed to subtract 21, you actually added it. So you had 7x is equal to positive 21. Well, that mistake would then trickle down and it would affect your final answer. So it's always important to go back and check your algebra. But make sure, of course, you've typed things exactly the way you intend. And if you have, and for some reason your answer doesn't match up with the calculator, go back and check your algebraic steps. Make sure you didn't maybe make a sign error, something like that. Okay, let's look at another one. So f of x is equal to x squared minus 5x plus 6. We want to know the degree. We want to find the x-intercept or the x-intercepts if we have more than one. And we want to find the y-intercept. Now, first off, we can verify that this is polynomial based on the form. We have terms involving x. Okay, we have exponents that are all positive whole numbers and then we just have the coefficients there attached to each of those terms. So we meet the requirements for this function being polynomial. Now the degree, our highest exponent in this case, is going to be two. So that tells me two things. Number one, it tells me my tails are gonna point in the same direction. It's an even degree, which means the tails point in the same direction. And it also tells me I'm gonna have a maximum of two x-intercepts. So I might have fewer than that, but I'll never have more than that. So in this case, I might have none, I might have one, or I might have two x-intercepts, but two is the maximum I can have. So let's see if we can find those x-intercepts. So remember to find our x-intercepts, we're letting y be zero. In other words, we're replacing f of x with zero, which means taking the function, setting it equal to zero, and then we want to solve for x. Now, algebraically, what we would have to do is what we call factoring. So if you're familiar with how to factor something like that, factoring means breaking that polynomial up into two pieces that are multiplied together, and then you set each of those individual pieces equal to zero. If you're familiar with how to factor, you are welcome to factor that, and then set each factor equal to zero, and then solve for x. We don't deal too much with factoring in this class just because it's a little bit beyond what we need to do. Most of what we need to do, we can do in the graphing calculator. And there's so many things to explore with factoring that unfortunately we just don't really have time to talk about. So what we're gonna do here, assuming we don't know how to deal with this algebraically, the fact that it has an exponent and it's not just linear is what makes the equation more complicated. If we don't know how to deal with it algebraically, this is a great time to use the table function in our graphing calculator. And then I'll also show you a way you can find your intercepts from your graph other than just tracing and hopping around on your graph. So let's look at this function. So go back into your y equals if you need, clear it out. We wanna type in our function here. So x squared minus five x plus six. So x squared minus five x, not that, delete 5x, sorry, having a moment here, delete, delete, there we go, 5x plus 6, okay. Now just a heads up, if you have a slightly older calculator and when you put in an exponent it gives you an up arrow, make sure you're out of the exponent before you start typing your next part of your function. And that's also true for this kind of calculator. Make sure you don't stay in the exponent and just keep typing. Make sure you get out of the exponent and then continue typing your function. And of course verify before you hit graph, verify that you typed what you intended to type. If you didn't, then nothing is going to look right. Okay, so let's graph this. Let's see what this is gonna look like. Now, I am still zoomed in. It looks like nothing happened. Well, there we have a little bit of graph. But overall, it looks like nothing happened. Remember, I was zoomed in. So a good thing to do would be to zoom back out to either zoom square or zoom standard. Now, I prefer zoom square just because I know that's gonna put my scale evenly along both axes. Oh, oh, I forgot. Okay, so you need to zoom square just means square it up in the current frame. So zoom standard first, which will take you back to being centered at the origin, 10 units in either direction. And then we can zoom square. Apologies. There we go. Okay, and it's going to trace it each time. So it's hard to see exactly what's going on 
supposedly we cross the x-axis maybe two times. It could be once, it could be zero times, it could be two times. It's kind of hard to tell just because it's so close to the axis, the vertex on this parabola that we call the tip the vertex. It's so close. So maybe once we're zoomed out and we have a sense of the picture, let's see if we can zoom in a little bit closer to that particular section. So I hit zoom in. I'm gonna scroll over to that particular area just roughly, and then hit enter and zoom back in. Okay, that gives us a better picture. So it looks like we're crossing at x equals two and crossing at x equals three. Now, how can we verify that? We can verify it from the table. So let's do that real quick and then I'll show you another way to verify it. So second and graph takes us into the table. Now remember, for an x-intercept, we let y be zero. So you're looking for the x values that have an associated y value of zero. So I see a couple zeros down here. Notice there's actually two of them. They correspond to x equals two and to x equals three. Now how do we know we're not gonna find more of them? How do we know we don't need to scroll and see if we can find more? Remember, the degree tells us that maximum we have two intercepts. If these two are both the x-intercepts, then that means that's all of them. That means we found them all. So our x-intercepts are going to be two and three. And again, that confirms pretty much what we see on the graph. So that's gonna be one way to find your intercepts using the table. Now, what about another way? How can we do it another way? Another option you can use is one of the operations within the calc menu. So calc stands for calculate, doing calculations related to your function and to its graph. So it's right above trace in blue. So if you hit second and trace, it's gonna take you into the calc menu. The second option, which says zero, remember zero, zero is another term for x-intercept. So if you highlight that and press enter, it's going to set it up so that you can find intercepts as well. Now, what does it say? It's got our function at the top. Below the coordinate plane, it says left bound. So what you have to do if you're going to use the zero function is you have to set boundaries within which your graph is gonna check for intercepts. So this particular graph has two intercepts. Which one do you want it to find? That's essentially what the calculator is asking. So you're gonna set boundaries on either side of your intercept, and then that's gonna tell your calculator just check for intercepts within this range. So for the left bound, we want to scroll over. Let's say we want to find the intercept that we now know is x equals two. I'm gonna scroll over to the left of it, anywhere to the left, just keep it close, but something that's very distinctly to the left of the intercept and then I'm gonna hit enter. And notice it puts in a boundary for me. That's now my left-hand boundary. What the calculator now knows is we're not gonna look for any intercepts to the left of that. That's the leftmost point where we'll check. Now it's asking me for a right bound. So now I need to scroll to the right of the intercept, the right of that location, and set a boundary to the right. So once I'm definitely to the right of the intercept, I'm gonna hit enter again, and it set a boundary. So what the calculator now knows is we only wanna check for intercepts within this particular range of the graph. Now it says guess, do we want you to guess? Yes, we want you to guess. So hit enter one more time and it's going to give you the value for your zero. So notice it says x equals two and it says y equals zero. When y is zero, that means the associated x value is a zero. It's what we call a zero, it is an x-intercept. So in this case, that particular x-intercept is going to be x equals two, which we did again confirm from the table. Now, if I wanted to find the intercept at x equals three, I would do the same thing, so calc and zeros, but I'd set my boundaries so that we're enclosing that particular intercept. Now, what would happen if I set boundaries and we didn't find an intercept in the boundaries? Let's see. So I'm gonna go back into calc, I'm gonna to go to zero, we wanna find zeros. Let's say we wanna look for a zero out here towards this side of the graph. So I wanna set a boundary to the left of that section. So I'm gonna hit enter, set it to the left, and then I'm gonna scroll over, hit enter, set it somewhere to the right. So we wanna check for x-intercepts for zeros within that range. Hit enter again, 
notice no sign change. What that means is there wasn't any location where we went from being below to above or from above to below the x-axis. There wasn't anywhere where we actually crossed the x-axis. So if we check for intercepts in a region where there are no intercepts, it's going to give us an error. So in order to use that particular operation effectively, you want to, there we go, quit, go back to graph. You want to make sure you're zoomed in far enough so that you can see, generally speaking, where your intercepts are. If you're zoomed way out, say you're zoomed way out, there we go. It's going to be hard to set the boundaries so that we know we truly are to the left and to the right of the intercept, so that it's enclosed within those two boundaries. So it's going to be important to zoom first, get close to those intercepts, and then you can set your boundaries a little bit more accurately. But that's going to be another technique you can use to find your intercepts. So you can use your table or you can use the zero function in that calc menu. Okay, so we have two x-intercepts at two and three. We know the degree is two. We found two intercepts. We know that's going to be all of them. Now we also want our y-intercept. So now we're going to allow x to be zero, substitute a zero in place of our input for our function, which means also substitute it in place of every instance of x. So that's going to be zero squared minus five times zero plus six. Why is the y-intercept usually easy to find? Well, most of those terms where you sub in a zero, they're just gonna go away. Zero means the term just goes away. So our first term is zero. Our second term is also zero. So all we're gonna be left with is that positive six. So that means our y-intercept is going to be positive six. I can also verify this from the graph. I can verify it from the table. So we cross, looks at about like six. Okay, we could zoom into that particular location if we want. So remember, zoom in and then scroll to where you want to zoom. Hit enter again. It's going to zoom in for you. Okay, it's going to show you a little bit closer. We can scroll to where we're close to the intercept. And it looks like round in that area, it's probably about six. Let's verify it from the table. Okay, when we let x be zero, which is what we do for a y-intercept, we get a corresponding y value of six. So again, that confirms our y-intercept is going to be six. So knowing the way the tails are pointing, again, we get that from the degree. If there's a positive number out front, we're pointing upward, both upward if we have an even degree, or if it's an odd degree, down to the left, up to the right. If we put a negative out front, our tails are gonna flip. And then our intercepts tell us a little bit more about what's happening in the middle between those tails. Okay, let's look at another kind of function that is closely related to a polynomial function. This is called a rational function. So the root of rational is ratio. We're taking a ratio of two things. So specifically, we're taking a ratio of polynomials. Okay, so we have our function notation, f of x, that's our generic label for our rational function. And we now have a numerator, we're going to call it n of x, and a denominator, which we're going to call d of x. You can think of each of these individual components, the numerator and denominator, as also being individual functions. So it's like we've combined two additional functions together, just one divided by the other. And again, in order for this function to be what we're going to call a rational function, each of those individual parts has to be a polynomial. So essentially think of the kinds of things we just looked at and we're putting two together in one problem using division, making a ratio of the two polynomials. Now you'll notice I also wrote something out to the side after the actual function rule, the function description. It says d of x is not equal to zero. Okay, d of x, that's our denominator, d for denominator. d of x is not equal to zero. That's a requirement for this function. Why is that there? Why can d of x not be zero? Well, if d of x were zero, we have a numerator, and then we're dividing by the number zero. Dividing by the number zero is one of those things that is not allowed in algebra. We cannot divide by the number zero. What happens if you try to do it in your calculator? So say you wanted to do one divided by zero. What happens if you try to do it? 
error, divide by zero. It's its own specific error in algebra. They actually have a label just for dividing by zero. Dividing by zero is undefined. It's not an operation that we can do in algebra. So we're not allowed to let the denominator of this function be zero because again, that's violating one of those fundamental rules for algebra. This is going to relate to our domain. D of X not being zero, essentially what that means is we cannot plug in any X values to our function, we can't choose any inputs, that would result in the denominator being zero. So any X value that we would substitute into this function that would make the denominator zero is not allowed. So that means our domain is going to be all real numbers. We can plug in most anything we want, except anything that's gonna make the denominator zero. If we plug in something that makes the denominator zero, then we can't find an output. So that means that particular value is not gonna be part of our domain. We can plug in anything else, but we can't plug in anything that makes the denominator zero. Now, what about the numerator? What if we plug something in that made the numerator zero? So say we had zero divided by one, something like that. Well, that just comes out to zero. If the numerator is zero and then we divide by another number, the result is just zero. That is perfectly fine. What we're focused on is can we get an output? Is there an output based on evaluating with that particular numerator and that particular denominator? If there is, then we don't have any problems. So any number that makes the numerator zero, that's fine, that's not an issue. Any number that makes the denominator zero, that's not allowed because the denominator cannot be zero. We know that that's undefined for algebra. So polynomial functions individually have a domain of all real numbers. You can plug in anything you want, no problems. As soon as we combine two polynomials together and create this rational function, the individual numerator and individual denominator, if we were to treat them as two separate parts, well, the individual domains are all real numbers. But because we've combined them using division, we now have created a problem where there wasn't one before. So even though d of x by itself would have a domain of all real numbers, because it's now in the denominator of something, it can now no longer be zero. So anything that makes it zero is not part of our domain. Well, what happens if we divide by zero? We know it gives us an error in the calculator. That error means something very specific if we were to look at the graph of a rational function, which is what we're going to do. Any location, any X value, any input that we would try to plug in that would make our denominator zero, that would give us this issue, this error in the calculator, represents what we call an asymptote. So A-S-Y-M-P-T-O-T-E, asymptote. An asymptote is an imaginary boundary that's gonna divide our graph into separate pieces. So polynomial functions, they continue all the way from the left to the right-hand side of the coordinate plane. Rational functions, that's not necessarily gonna happen. There will be some breaks and some gaps. Those gaps are imaginary vertical lines that we call asymptotes. Where are those boundaries going to occur? They're going to occur wherever we'd have an X value that would make the denominator zero. So if we were to look at the domain, identify all those places where we have an X value excluded from the domain, well, those particular values, those particular locations are gonna to correspond to these boundaries on the graph. Now, I wanna emphasize that these boundaries are not really there. We're not actually drawing a line. There's not actually a line there on the graph. Notice they've been drawn as dotted lines. They're drawn as dotted lines because they're not really there. Technically speaking, there's nothing there. So if we were to look at, for instance, this graph, it has a branch to the left of that boundary. It has a branch to the right of the boundary. There at that boundary, we've drawn a dotted line, but technically there's nothing there. It's this gap, it's a hole in the graph. There at what looks like x equals two, there's stuff to the left of two, there's stuff to the right at two, of two, but right there at two itself, there isn't actually anything. There's just a big hole, a big gap in the graph. Same thing here at negative two and positive two, and then here at x equals zero.
So knowing where those boundaries are, that's gonna be crucial to getting an accurate graph for one of these functions. And you probably guessed, you can find it on the graphing calculator. I'm gonna show you how you'd find it both algebraically and how you'd find these things on the graphing calculator. So here's a few examples of what a rational functions graph can look like. We can get some pretty exotic graphs. The more complicated the numerator and denominator are, the more complicated the graph is going to be. The more complicated the denominator is, the more asymptotes, the more boundaries we're going to have. So having, let's just say, getting into the details of a rational function, some of it's going to go a little bit beyond what we're going to be capable of doing. So we're going to rely on the graphing calculator here to really help us with the graphing and give us information about our graph. So let's talk a little bit more about those asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes, where are those boundaries? First thing we have to do is we have to assume that our function is fully reduced. In other words, anything that's common in the numerator and denominator needs to have been canceled out. It needs to have been reduced. If there's anything that could be reduced that hasn't been, that can affect how we find the vertical asymptotes and it will affect the accuracy of our answers. So we have to make sure our numerator and denominator are as simple as they can be and that there's nothing common in the numerator and denominator that would cancel. Okay, so assuming that's where we are, assuming everything is fully simplified, then our vertical asymptotes are all gonna be of the form x is equal to c, or x is equal to a number. x is equal to, and then a number, represents a vertical line. That is the equation for a vertical line. x is equal to a number is the vertical line that goes through that particular number on the x-axis. So because our vertical asymptotes are lines, this is going to be the form of the equation we write for each of those vertical lines, each of those vertical boundaries. Now the number part, that's ultimately what we're looking for. x equal to just, just the form of this equation. It's the form that represents these vertical boundaries. But the number it's equal to, each of those numbers is going to be a value that we would try to plug into our function that would make our denominator zero. So those values that we excluded from the domain, those values that we plugged in, they made the denominator zero, they gave us a problem, we said throw them out, we can't use them. Those are gonna be the numbers that correspond to our vertical asymptotes. So for instance, this particular graph right here, notice we have a boundary at negative two and we have a boundary at positive two. Positive two and negative two would be the two different values of x that make our denominator zero. So because those two values of x make this denominator zero, they correspond to locations for our asymptotes. So if we were going to write the equations of those vertical lines, the equation for the leftmost line would be x is equal to negative two, and the equation for the rightmost line would be x is equal to positive two. Those would be the equations for our asymptotes. Now what if you just write two and negative two? That is not sufficient. Two and negative two are just numbers. They aren't even points on the plane. They're just numbers. If we're saying that those two numbers represent the location for an asymptote, an asymptote is a line. A line is always represented by an equation. If it's a vertical line, it's always represented by an equation of the form x equals. So having the x equals is just as important as having the negative two or the positive two. All of that goes together to form the equations for those asymptotes. So it's gonna be crucial that you pay attention to form in these situations. You need to know what x values make the denominator zero, and then the equations of the asymptotes are always gonna be x is equal to whatever that number or those numbers are. Now, look at the first graph. We also have a horizontal dotted line. It's a boundary that separates things above and below. So we can have vertical boundaries that separate left and right. We can also have horizontal boundaries that separate things above and below. We call this a horizontal asymptote. Now finding horizontal asymptotes is gonna be slightly more complicated than finding vertical asymptotes. There's a little bit more involved. So what we're gonna do in order to find any horizontal asymptotes is we're gonna compare the degree in the numerator and the degree in the denominator. 
So remember, the individual numerator and denominator, those are polynomials. If you look at each of them individually, each one has a degree, each one has a highest exponent. We're comparing the highest exponent in the numerator and the highest exponent in the denominator. So let's call them n for the numerator and d for the denominator. So the highest exponent in the numerator, the highest exponent in the denominator. We're comparing how they relate to one another. In other words, which one is larger? So we fall under three possible cases, okay? Possibility number one is that the degree in the numerator is less than the degree in the denominator. So that would be like having an exponent of one on the top and an exponent of two on the bottom, something like that. If we fall under that case, regardless of what the actual numbers are, the degree in the numerator is less than the degree in the denominator, then our horizontal boundary is going to be the line y equals zero, also known as the x-axis. y equals zero is the equation representing the x-axis. So anytime we look at our numerator and denominator and the degree in the numerator is less than the degree in the denominator, we know we're gonna have a horizontal boundary on our graph there at the x-axis. So that actually happened for this graph. If you look at these two branches for the graph, notice right as we taper off on the ends, we're kind of hugging that x-axis. That's what an asymptote is gonna look like if it's a horizontal asymptote. We're hugging it either above or below or possibly both. We could determine that that was the asymptote just by looking at the function, looking at the numerator, looking at the denominator. The degree in the denominator is two. Now, what about the degree in the numerator? Be careful here. Is there an x in the numerator? In this case, there is no x in the numerator. If there's no x, then the understood exponent on x is actually zero. Anything to the zero power is one. So if we had x and took it to the zero power, well, it just becomes one, which means we don't actually see it there in the numerator. So the degree in the numerator is not one. If the degree were one, we would have to have not only an eight, but we'd have to have eight x. That would correspond to a degree of one. This numerator has a degree of zero because there is no x in the numerator. So a degree of zero on the top, a degree of two on the bottom, that corresponds to this case. The numerator's degree is less than the denominator's degree, so we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. Okay, maybe it's not n is less than d. Maybe they are equal. That is a possibility as well. If the degree in the numerator and the degree in the denominator are the same, our horizontal asymptote is still gonna be y equals. y equals a number is gonna be the form for a horizontal line. So x equals a number is a vertical line, y equals a number is a horizontal line. The number it's going to be equal to is going to be the ratio of the leading coefficients for our numerator and our denominator. So if we looked at the two terms that we compared, the two terms that had our degrees, the one in the numerator, the one in the denominator, compared them, we're looking at the leading coefficients, the numbers out in front of those terms. If we were to take the one on the top, and divide it by the one on the bottom, that's gonna give us a number. That number is gonna be what we're equal to. So it's gonna be y is equal to that number, the ratio of the leading coefficients, whatever that number is. This particular function represents this case. So if you look at the numerator, we have an x, that's the highest x. It has an exponent of one. The denominator also has an x with an exponent of one. So the degree in the numerator is one, the degree in the denominator is also one. So we fall under this particular case where the degrees are the same. So our horizontal asymptote is gonna be y is equal to the ratio of the leading coefficients. So what are the leading coefficients here? Well, we're comparing those two terms that gave us our degree. In our numerator, we don't actually see a coefficient on x, which means the understood coefficient, the number out front, is understood to be one. Same thing in the denominator. That x also doesn't have a written coefficient, so it's understood to be one. So the ratio of the leading coefficients is gonna be the one in the numerator divided by the one in the denominator. Well, one divided by one 
That just gives us one. So that means this particular function is gonna have a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to one over one, which is one, y is equal to one. You can actually see that reflected on the graph. So look where that horizontal boundary is. It crosses through the y-axis at one. So this particular line, this particular boundary, is y is equal to one. And that's why, just based on the function, we can determine where that asymptote would be and why it would be at y equals one. Now the only other possibility is that we have a higher degree in the numerator than we have in the denominator. That is also a possibility. If that's the case, then there is no horizontal asymptote. So say we had an exponent of two in the numerator, and the highest exponent in the denominator was one, we would fall under that case. If that's the situation, then it's still a rational function, but that particular rational function's graph is not gonna have a horizontal boundary. It may have vertical boundaries, vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, completely independent. One does not affect the other, but that particular case, we would have a graph that just doesn't have any horizontal boundaries attached to it. So let's look at a couple examples of these kinds of functions. So we want to find our intercepts. They're still functions, they still have intercepts. We still have locations where we cross the x-axis, cross the y-axis. We want to determine the domain for the function. Remember, it's not necessarily gonna be all real numbers. We have some issues with domain. And then we want to find our asymptotes, which is gonna be the most important part in here. It's gonna be the part that sort of is the hallmark of this kind of function. So once we have all of that, we want to graph it in the calculator and we'll use the calculator to verify the things we've found. Okay, so our first function is going to be f of x is equal to x plus three divided by x minus three. So the numerator is a polynomial, the denominator is a polynomial, so we know this is a rational function. Now let's start with our intercepts. Okay, so x-intercepts, y-intercepts. The rule for finding them never changes. So exactly what we did with the polynomial functions, we're gonna do here. The definition for an x-intercept is that y is zero. So it's the x value or values that correspond to a y value of zero. So in other words, if we take our function, replace y, aka f of x, with zero, and then solve that equation, whatever x values we get represent our x-intercepts. Now this is a slightly more complicated equation to solve than, for instance, the polynomial equations. The issue is that we now have a denominator where we didn't have one before. How could this ratio of two numbers be equal to zero? Well, we have to think about how we could divide two numbers and get zero. So let's start off by thinking about numbers that wouldn't be zero. Say we take a non-zero number and divide by another non-zero number. Well, if that's the case, we're never gonna get an output of zero. So the only way you can divide two numbers and get an output of zero is if one of the numbers is zero. So in order to divide and get zero as an output, one of the numbers you divided has to be zero. Well, which one is it gonna be? Is it gonna be the number you divided into or is it the number you divided in? Which one has to be zero in order for the division to come out to zero overall? Well, let's experiment with the calculator and let's see what happens. What happens if the numerator is zero? So the numerator is zero and we divide by another number. So say something like zero divided by one, something like that. So the numerator is zero and the denominator is just whatever. In that case, notice the whole thing comes out to zero. So if the numerator is zero and we divide it by the denominator, the output we get is gonna be zero. Now what if the denominator were zero? That's still a division involving zero. So say we had one divided by zero. Well remember, that gives us a problem. That's not allowed. Dividing by zero is undefined. It gives you an error. So if the denominator is zero, we have a problem. If the numerator is zero, then the whole thing comes out to zero. So big takeaway, in order to solve this equation, in order for this equation to be true, the only way we can take a number and divide by another number and get zero as the result is if the numerator is 
zero. So solving this rational equation is the same thing as solving the equation we have if we just set the numerator equal to zero. The numerator being zero is the only way the whole ratio can come out to zero. The denominator doesn't affect it in this case. So if we set that numerator equal to zero, which again is the only way we can get a zero from division, we're just solving that little equation, which is quite simple as compared to this one. So subtract your three in this case from both sides, so we get x is negative three. So our x-intercept is going to be negative three. That's gonna be the only one we find. Y-intercept, also the same kind of thing as for finding a polynomial's y-intercept. We want x to be zero, which means we're solving for the associated y value. So that means replacing our input with zero, which then tells us take our generic input x and make it zero based on that specific input. So our numerator is gonna be zero plus three and our denominator is gonna be zero minus three. So the numerator simplifies to three, the denominator simplifies to negative three. So three divided by three is one, but we flip the sign because it's a positive divided by a negative. So that result is going to be negative one. So this particular function has a y-intercept at negative one. So an x-intercept at negative three, a y-intercept at negative one. If those are our only intercepts, what that tells us is that the rest of the graph has to be somewhere in a quadrant. It can't be on one of the axes. It's in one of the four quadrants. Okay, what about the domain? That's also gonna give us information about the graph. It's gonna tell us what values we continue across and where we maybe run into a problem. The domain is everything that we can plug in legally. So we can plug in most anything we want. The only time we run into an issue is, remember, if the denominator is zero. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what would make that denominator zero? that's unallowed. Whatever x value makes the denominator zero, it's not allowed. We can't allow x to be that value. Well, if the denominator is x minus three, the only number that would make that denominator zero is gonna be positive three. Three minus three would come out to zero. So x equals positive three is not allowed as an input because it would require us dividing by zero, which we know is not allowed. So our domain for this function is gonna be all real numbers except that number that makes the denominator zero, which in this case is going to be three. So all real numbers except three. That directly gives us information about the vertical asymptote. Wherever we're excluding a number from the domain, that's gonna be the location for the vertical asymptote. So in this case, the vertical asymptote is what we get from setting the denominator equal to zero, which would then be x is equal to three. So three is what we excluded from the domain. Three then corresponds to a vertical asymptote. So wherever we have a hole in the graph, that hole corresponds to one of those vertical boundaries. In this case, it's at three. Now don't forget that x equals part, that's gonna be important. Three by itself is just a number. X equals three is the vertical line that goes through three. So that x equals part, that's gonna be important. So that is going to be the boundary on this graph. Everything to the left of three is gonna be one part of the graph. Everything to the right of three is gonna be another part of the graph. And then we also want to see if we have a horizontal asymptote. Remember, there's a possibility that we don't have one at all. But there's also a possibility that we do have one. So for this one, we're comparing the numerator and denominator. What's the degree in the numerator? What's the degree in the denominator? So in the numerator, our highest exponent on x is going to be one. In the denominator, the highest exponent on x is also going to be one. So the numerator's degree is one, the denominator's degree is one as well. So let's go back to that table and let's see where we fall. Okay, we're under the case where the numerator's degree, the denominator's degree, they're both the same. So that tells us that we do have a horizontal asymptote and it's gonna be of the form y is equal to the ratio of the leading coefficients. So what are our leading coefficients in this case? Well, we're looking at the terms that gave us the degree. In this case, the numerator's term is x, the denominator's term is also x. The coefficients on those terms, we don't actually see them, which means they're understood to be one. So the numerator has a leading coefficient of one, 
the denominator also has a leading coefficient of one. So our horizontal asymptote is gonna be y is equal to that ratio, one over one. Well, one over one, that division just comes out to one. So our horizontal asymptote, our horizontal boundary, dividing our graph above and below this line, is gonna be the horizontal line, y is equal to one. Well, that's a lot of stuff to put together. We have intercepts, we know the domain. The domain corresponds to this vertical asymptote. The break in the domain corresponds to the vertical asymptote. And then we also have this horizontal boundary. So let's put all of that together and let's see what that would look like with the graphing calculator. Okay, so I'm gonna clear out what I already have. This is going to be one of the times where you have to be very careful about how you type this into your calculator. I'm going to type something that's wrong, so I don't want you to type this yet. I'm just going to type it and I want to show you how you don't type it. So say you just literally wrote it like it seems. So we have x plus 3 divided by x minus 3. Okay. That looks kind of like what we have, right? This is technically wrong. This is not an okay way to type in this function. Why not? Your calculator is very literal. In terms of how it looks at the operations and follows the order of operations, your calculator is very literal. So what your calculator sees when you type something like this, takes order of operations into account, but only relates things that are directly next to each other. So in this case, we have an addition, a division, and a subtraction. When your calculator sees this, it does three divided by x, okay? Because that's the first thing that would happen with order of operations. So three divided by x as one particular unit. Then it would add on an x and it would subtract a three from all of that. That is not what this function represents. This function represents the whole factor x plus 3 divided by the whole factor x minus 3. In other words, we need to add and subtract individually before we divide. That is not what the calculator thinks you intend in this case. The calculator thinks you mean take 3 divided by x as one unit and then add on an x to all of that and subtract a three from all of that. In other words, it's doing things out of the order you really want it to do them in. So let's clear this because again, it's wrong. How do you make sure your graph real, or your calculator really does what you want? You're gonna have to put parentheses around your numerator individually and your denominator individually. That way your calculator knows this whole thing, this is the entire numerator. This whole thing, the entire denominator. We want to divide these clusters of things rather than just taking three and dividing by x. So when I type this in, I'm gonna put parentheses around my numerator. Make sure you always close your parentheses. And then I'm gonna divide by, in parentheses, x minus three. That is gonna be the way you're gonna to have to type it in order to get your graphing calculator to understand what you mean. So whole numerator in parentheses, whole denominator in parentheses. It does each of those as one individual unit and it divides them as a whole. That's gonna be how you type it. So let's hit graph. Okay, and I'm still zoomed kind of strangely, so it looks like nothing happened. I'm gonna zoom back to zoom standard. There we go. And this is gonna be the graph we get. Now you may have some variations for this. One thing you may see on your graph that's notably absent here, you may actually see a line drawn between the two branches. Your calculator may actually draw the vertical asymptote for you. In this case, mine doesn't, but if yours does, that's okay. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It's just a formatting type thing with your calculator. But this is going to be the graph we get. So what do we want to verify? Well, we'd like to verify our intercepts. It'd be nice to verify the asymptotes too. Now we can verify the vertical asymptote. We cannot actually verify the horizontal asymptote specifically from the graph, but I'll show you how to kind of infer it just based on looking at the values from the table. So we have a picture. Let's go verify all those individual components from the table. So second and graph takes us into the table. Let's look for our intercepts first. How we find them with a polynomial function, same thing as what we do for a rational function. We're looking for where y is zero, 
and we're looking for where x is zero. So here's where y is zero. That's gonna to correspond to x is equal to negative three. And we did say that that was our x-intercept, so that checks out. How do we know there's only gonna be one? Well, we only get an intercept if the numerator is zero. The numerator itself has a degree of one, which means max, we get one x-intercept from that. So that's gonna be the only x value we get. So we know there's only one, we know we found everything we need. Okay, now the y-intercept comes when x is zero. So if we scroll to where x is zero, that's gonna to correspond to y is equal to negative one. So that again confirms our y-intercept. Now there's something that kind of sticks out like a sore thumb here. You can probably spot it really quickly. That error. In the y column, there's an error. Notice where the y column's error occurs. What x value does it match with? It matches with x equals three. Well, what does x equals three have to do with this particular problem? That was the value excluded from the domain, and it was the value that gave you your vertical asymptote. Anywhere you see an error when you type in one of these functions, that's gonna to correspond to the break in the domain, which again represents your vertical asymptote. So if you can find those errors, that's gonna tell you where those vertical asymptotes are. So in this case, we have one at x equals three, that's the break in the domain, and x equals three is our vertical asymptote. Okay, now again, the horizontal asymptote, there's not gonna be anything specific in the table that says this is the asymptote, but here's how you can sort of infer what it is from the table. Let's go back and look at the graph really quickly. We said the horizontal asymptote was at y equals one. In other words, there's a horizontal boundary right there, and that seems to make sense. What you'll notice though, is as you trace the right-hand branch and keep going further and further out, if you were to go further and further out on this tail of the graph, it's gonna get really, really close to that boundary. The graphs are gonna hug these boundaries. They get really close to them, but they never touch them, they never cross them. So as you continue increasing, as your X values get bigger and bigger and bigger, your Y values are going to approach your horizontal asymptote. Now, same thing on the other side. If we were to follow this branch out further and further, in other words, make the X values more negative, it's gonna get closer and closer and closer to that boundary. But again, it's never gonna to touch it, it's never gonna cross it. So we can actually see that behavior from the table. So go back into the table. What we're looking for is what happens when the X values get really big or really big but negative. So let's scroll. Now in order to scroll and continue to go down, you have to be in the X column. So if you're in the Y column, make sure you arrow over, you're in the X column, and then we're gonna scroll. I want you to watch the Y values as we scroll. What's happening to the Y values? Well, they're definitely decreasing, but they're not decreasing very fast, okay? They're in the one point something range, so 1.1, see how far we have to go. It's, we'd have to go a good ways. Now we get to 1.0, okay? As we keep going, it's gonna continue to, do, to decrease. But notice it's not decreasing very fast. It's just a little bit at a time. What's happening though is as we continue further out, the Y values are getting closer and closer and closer to one. As you keep going, it'll still be one point something. You're never actually going to get to the point where it goes below one. So the value that our Y values are approaching as our X values get bigger and bigger, that is the location of our horizontal asymptote. So because our Y values are getting closer and closer and closer to one as we continue going further and out in the positive X direction, that tells us where the horizontal asymptote is. Now we should also verify that on the other side because we should see the same kind of thing on the other side. The only difference is here the Y values are bigger than one, which means we're currently above that boundary on that side of the graph. On the other side of the graph, if you remember what the picture looked like, we're actually below the boundary. So what's gonna happen with those negative numbers? Well, they're below one, they keep getting bigger, they're continuing to increase, Okay, notice they're not increasing very fast, but they're continuing to increase just a little at a time. And they keep increasing just a little bit, 
what are they getting close to? They're getting close to one. So as we continue to increase, our values are getting closer and closer and closer to one, but they're below one. So on the left-hand side of the graph, our values are below one. On the right-hand side of the graph, our values are above one, but our Y values are getting closer and closer and closer to that specific value of one. That's what tells us that our horizontal asymptote is at one. So that's not really a foolproof way of saying this is the asymptote, but if you've already determined what you think it is algebraically, that's a way of at least semi-verifying that your algebra makes sense. So we can see the location in general on the graph, but this is a way to confirm from the table, which again is a little bit more foolproof, um, just verify from the table that what we're seeing with the algebra makes sense. Now give me a minute, I'm scrolling all the way back. Keep in mind, unfortunately, your calculator is such that once you scroll way out into the big numbers, it kind of leaves it there until you manually scroll back. So you do have to manually scroll back so that you're centered around zero. Okay. Let's look at another example. So f of x is equal to 3x divided by x plus 2. We want to find our intercepts, find the domain, any vertical asymptotes, and any horizontal asymptotes. So x-intercepts, we're going to let y be 0, which means replace f of x with 0. Now, same thing that happened here happens for any rational function. How do we divide two numbers and get 0? Well, the only way we can divide two numbers and get zero is if the numerator is zero. So we can set the numerator equal to zero. For some reason, students see an equation like this and they kind of freak out. Don't freak out about something like that. Just think about how you would isolate x. What would you have to do to get x by itself? Well, x is multiplied by three. So if you were to divide both sides by three, you have zero divided by three. Well, what's zero divided by three? Zero divided by three is just zero. So that means x equals zero is your x-intercept. Now this is kind of unique. Think about what x equals zero looks like as we solve for the y-intercept. So to let the y-intercept, or to find the y-intercept, we're gonna let x be zero, substitute it into the function in place of our input. So three times zero divided by zero plus two. So three times zero is zero, so that's gonna be our numerator. Zero plus two is two, that's our denominator. Zero divided by two is gonna be zero. So our y-intercept is also zero. So the x-intercept is zero, the y-intercept is also zero. Why is this? Well, zero, zero, the origin, is both an x-intercept and a y-intercept. So it's possible that we're gonna get the same x-intercept and y-intercept. And again, that's because that particular point crosses both axes. So whereas we got two separate points for our intercepts for the first function, for this function, we only have one intercept. It's that intercept at the origin. So just like before, that means that the rest of the graph has to be somewhere in one of the four quadrants. If that's the only location where we touch or cross an axis, then everything else has to be in one of the four quadrants. Okay, so that's gonna be the location where we cross. Now, what about the domain? In other words, where do we have a break in the graph and where are we gonna find an asymptote? Well, then we know the thing that's not allowed is for the denominator to be zero. If the numerator is zero, we have an x-intercept. If the denominator is zero, then we're dividing by zero and we know that's not allowed. What number would make this denominator zero? Well, if x plus two is equal to zero, the only x value that would make that happen would be negative two. Negative two plus two comes out to zero. So our domain is all real numbers except that one value that makes the denominator zero, which is negative two. What happens at negative two? That's where we have a vertical asymptote. So the vertical line that goes through negative two is our vertical asymptote in this case. So the vertical asymptote is gonna be the line x equals negative two. Again, make sure you have that x equals part. Negative two by itself is just a number. X equals negative two is the vertical line that goes through negative two, and our vertical asymptote is a vertical line. Our horizontal asymptote, if we have one, we compare the numerator's degree with the denominator's degree. So in the numerator, we have an x 
the highest exponent is going to be 1. That particular x has an understood exponent of 1. The denominator also has a degree of 1. So both of these degrees are 1. They're both the same. So that means we're actually under the same case as we were before. So our horizontal asymptote is going to be y is equal to the ratio of the leading coefficients. So we're looking at the numerator, looking at the denominator, looking at those two terms that gave us our degree, and we're taking the coefficient on top divided by the coefficient on the bottom. Well, in the numerator, we have 3x, so the coefficient is going to be 3, and in the denominator, we have x, so the coefficient is going to be 1. So the ratio we want is going to be 3 over 1. Well, 3 over 1, we divide 3 by 1, and we get 3. So our horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals 3. So that's going to be our horizontal boundary that separates our graph above and below. So let's look at that one. Let's graph that one. Now, same issue with typing in the function. Remember, you need parentheses around the numerator and the denominator. Otherwise, it will not interpret it the way you're intending for it to interpret it. So numerator in parentheses, 3x divided by denominator in parentheses, x plus 2. And let's hit graph. And there we go. Okay, so immediately, that intercept, pretty easy to spot. We have an intercept there at the origin. We have a vertical boundary. Again, your calculator may draw it. Mine doesn't draw it. And then we also have a horizontal boundary. But again, we can't necessarily see that. So let's verify the intercept and let's verify the vertical asymptote from the graph. And then I want to show you another way to potentially verify the horizontal asymptote. So let's go into the table. Okay, immediately I see that error. That error is at negative 2. Remember the error corresponds to a hole which looks like a vertical line. So x equals negative 2 is excluded from the domain and it also corresponds to a vertical asymptote. The table confirms that. Now we said that we have a shared intercept at 0, 0 for both x and y. When x is 0, y is 0. When y is 0, x is 0. So that is going to be our only intercept on the graph. And the graph does, in fact, confirm this. So the rest of the graph either stays above the x-axis or it stays below the x-axis. This is the only place we touch or cross. Now, we looked a little bit about how we'd verify the horizontal asymptote just based on what we see in the table. We could do that again here, but I want to show you another option for how you can sort of model what's happening with the asymptote. We're saying that it's y is equal to 3. So I want to actually type that in and put it on the coordinate plane with my actual graph. So I'm going to go back to y equals, leave this particular function alone, but now we want to type in the next thing. We want to type y is equal to 3. So I have the y is equal to, and it's just y is equal to 3. Now you might be asking, what about the vertical asymptote? What if I want to graph that? Unfortunately, you can't graph a vertical line. The reason you can't graph a vertical line is because everything is of the form y equals. A vertical line is of the form x equals. Unfortunately, there's no way for you to type in x equals using your graphing calculator, so you're not going to be able to graph the vertical asymptote. But again, you can find it pretty easily in the table just by spotting that error, or if there's more than one, you'll find more than one error. So let's graph it now. So we'll see the actual function, and then it will graph the asymptote, what we're saying is the asymptote, on top of that. There we go. So we have our function, which is already there, and then we have that horizontal line. So that pretty much confirms that that would be the right boundary. Now, do we really know what happens out here or what happens out here just looking at the graph? The answer is no, but this boundary does appear to make sense. Everything to the left of the vertical asymptote is above that. Everything to the right of the vertical asymptote is below that line. So that, that boundary there at y equals 3 does make sense based on the graph we have. So that's a little taste of graphing for both of these types of functions.
I want to talk a little bit about application. Where do you see something like a polynomial function or a rational function in application? There are actually a lot of different applications for these types of functions. So in the first section, when we talked about functions in general, we looked at um, cost, or cost, what's the word? Um, I lost it. Profit and loss, there we go, profit and loss analysis. And we looked at four different functions. We had a cost function, we had a price demand function, a revenue function, and then we also had a profit function. All four of those functions would be considered polynomial functions, just based on the form that they take on. If you picture what's happening with x, it's x potentially with an exponent of 1, maybe an exponent of 2, depending on the function we're looking at. But in general, those functions are polynomial based on what we call a polynomial function. So we've seen some polynomial functions. Let's look at a specific application where we might use a rational function. Okay. So going back to this context of manufacturing, costs, revenues, these kinds of things, here's our example. A small manufacturer has fixed daily costs of $200 and total costs are $3,800 per day when the daily output is 20 items. Okay, so first question, if the cost per day, C of X, is linearly related to the number of items produced, which is represented by our input variable x, we want to write an equation for the cost function. Okay, so we know information about our costs. We want to write the function that models our cost for any level of output, any particular production level. Now, when we talked originally about the cost function, we talked about the fixed component versus the variable component. And originally, we were just told this is the fixed cost and this is the variable cost per unit. This is not exactly what we've been told here. We've been given the fixed cost, but rather than being given a variable cost, we've been told that the total cost overall is gonna be $3,800 when we're producing 20 items. So what would go into this total cost? Well, this total cost actually is made up of two components. It's made up of the fixed cost that we have to pay no matter what. It's always gonna be $200 no matter what. What's left over though? There's definitely more than $200 worth of cost. The rest of it is associated with the variable costs of producing 20 items. So if we want to write the cost function, we need to know fixed cost, we need to know cost per unit, we can use this $3,800 that corresponds to producing 20 items to find each of those values, okay? So 3,800 is part fixed, part variable. The fixed part is gonna be $200. So if we were to take the 3,800 and subtract out that fixed cost, what's left over is $3,600. That's the component of cost that corresponds to actual production, that corresponds to something variable. Well, it's always gonna be the same cost per unit. That's the linearly related component. If we say that everything is linear, linearly related, cost is linearly related, what that means is that the cost is gonna be the same for every individual unit. That's not always the case, but here we're being told that cost is gonna be the same per unit. Well, the variable cost is $3,600 if we make 20 items. So if we divided that $3,600 up over those 20 items, that's gonna give us the cost per unit. And so we have $3,600, Let's type that right, $3,600 divided across 20 units. That's gonna be $180 per unit. So $180 per unit for 20 units, and then that adds up to 3,800 when we factor in the fixed cost. So that means our cost function is going to be the fixed cost of $200 plus 180 times the number of items we produce. So if we only produce one item, it's gonna be 180 times one plus the 200. If we produce two, it's gonna be 180 times two plus the 200 and then so on and so forth. So this would be considered a polynomial function. It falls under the category of being polynomial. Where does a rational function come into play? Well, here's an example of a rational function. The average cost per item 
is C bar of X. It's C with a bar over top. That's in this case representing average cost per item. It's defined as our cost divided by X. So in other words, if we take the whole cost and divide it up over the number of items we make, then that's going to give us the average cost per unit. So the actual function is going to take our cost function, which we just found, and it's going to divide it by X. So this is going to be our average cost function. It tells us based on how many items we produce, this is on average what it costs to produce. Well, doesn't it cost $180 to produce per item? Yes and no. It's $180 worth of variable cost, but what about that fixed cost? That $200, that is also divided up across our whole production. So when we're talking about average cost, that's taking into account the variable cost, which we know is fixed per item, it's $180 per item, but that $200 is then also being distributed across the number of items we're producing. So that's going to be our average cost function. Then we want to graph this function. We're going to use our graphing calculator, graph it. And the question is, based on this graph, let's interpret. What does the average cost tend towards, in other words, what does it approach as production increases? In other words, as we continue to produce more and more and more and more, what's going to be, roughly speaking, the average cost for each of the items we produce? So let's graph this. Let's put it in the graphing calculator. Parentheses around the numerator, parentheses around the denominator. Don't forget that. So we have 200 plus 180x in our numerator. And I left my parentheses. I did exactly what I told you not to do. Plus 180x. There we go. So 200 plus 180x divided by x. Now the x, you don't actually have to put parentheses around just because it's a single thing in the denominator but for the sake of being consistent, you can do so and it's not gonna make a difference. So let's graph that. Now, this doesn't look anything like the other functions we graphed. Why is that? Well, it's because the numbers are so big that you can't really see what's going on just looking at the graph. So what we really wanna look at here is the table. The table is gonna give us more information that the graph can't communicate. So second, graph takes us into the table. Okay, so when we're at zero, there's an error. Why do we have an error at zero? Well, what number makes our denominator zero? In this case, x equals zero makes the denominator zero. So if we were thinking about a vertical asymptote, that's where it's going to be. So the question we want to answer using the table is what happens to average cost as production increases? So as we continue to produce more and more and more units, what's happening to this average cost that's being distributed across production. So we wanna see as we continue to increase, as we produce more and more items, what's happening to the cost, in other words, our Y value. So when we're at, let's see, when we're at 20 units, it's $190 on average. Now remember, variable cost is 180, but we're also distributing the $200 across everything. What happens when we get to 30? When we get to 30, we're at about 187. What about 40? 185, getting higher, or getting lower, excuse me. 50, we're at 184. What if we wanna skip some of this and go a little bit further out? I wanna show you a way you can do that. We can change some of the settings in the table, but we can also use one of the calc operations for the graph. So let's go back into the graph. Again, we don't really see much, but we can get individual values on the graph even if we can't see them. So let's go back into calc. Now, instead of using zero, I'm gonna use value. So I'm gonna hit value. Value is going to allow you to find Y values associated with specific X values. So you can type in your given X value and it'll solve for the Y value for you. Now, what if I type zero? Notice it doesn't give me anything. That's because it's undefined there. Remember, that's where my vertical asymptote is. So it's not gonna give me a Y value. But for any other value I type in, it's going to give me an output. 
So why might this be helpful? Well, it's gonna keep you from having to scroll through the table to look at the really big X values. So let's say we want X equals 100, which means producing 100 items and then taking the average cost. So if X is 100, let's see, what did I do? Graph, calc, value, X equals 100, invalid. Attempt to use a variable function where it is not valid. I am not sure what happened there. I'm trying to tell you to do something and it's not even working for me. I'm gonna to have to investigate that a little further. Let's just go back and look at the table and I'll go back and look at that and see what's going on. So if we wanted to look at 100, we can get it from the table. So let's keep going. Watch the Y values as we keep going. They're decreasing slowly. We're at about 182. When we get to 100, we're at exactly 182. We started at 190 when we were at 20 items. We're at 100 items and we're at 182. So what's happening? It's getting closer and closer and closer to a specific value. What value is it approaching? It's approaching 180. 180 is our cost per item. It's approaching that 180. Why does that make sense? Why does that happen here? Well, if you think about producing 100 items or producing 1,000 items or a million items, the fixed cost never changes. It's $200 no matter what. 180 is always gonna be the cost per unit in terms of variable costs. But as you continue to produce more and more items, essentially you're taking those fixed costs and you're spreading them out across, across all the items you're producing. Well, say you produced 200 items, okay? Well, if you produce 200 items, then we can distribute a dollar of that to every single item. So for each individual item, it costs $180. And then if we distribute that $200 across the 200 items, well, that's a dollar per item. So it'd be 181 on average per unit. The more and more and more we produce, the further we can spread out that fixed cost. So as we continue to increase production, it still costs $180 to, to produce per unit, but that $200 ends up being spread out further. The further it's spread out, the less of it is actually accumulated per item. So it eventually could get to the point where maybe it only costs one cent additional to produce in terms of redistributing that 200 across our production. So as we continue to increase production, our cost per item is getting really, really, really close to $180, just because that $200 is being distributed out in so many different ways in such small increments. So in this case, our cost is going to approach $180, or our average cost is gonna approach $180 if we continue to increase production. So that's gonna be one example of how we can use a rational function and also a polynomial function in application. We're gonna see a lot of different situations um, throughout the course where these kind of um, functions appear in the context of actual physical situations.